In the name of the one holy and living God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be here with you on this uh, very brisk morning. I'm actually here at the Church of the Good Shepherd, and um, it's it's great to to be here. And I'm I'm sorry that we're not all together in person. Of course, you've heard that said many times, but it, it's it's going it's going to happen. I don't know when, but but it. Uh, but it's going to happen. I saw on a map of the country and COVID act now, uh, you know, it's different shades of, of red, deep red, almost a deep purple to, to red, orange to yellow. And then I just saw these little flecks of green, which means that COVID is on track to be uh, contained in, in some places in the Midwest. And we just pray that that's going to continue. Those little green dots are gonna continue to grow and grow. This morning, we're going to consider how the Holy Spirit moves among us to call us, as Jesus called those first disciples, those first apostles who followed him <clears throat> from their nets and from their, their fishing barks on the Sea of Galilee. But for first, I'd like to go back two weeks ago. Um, Two weeks ago on the Sunday, immediately after the Feast of the Epiphany, um, January 10th, if you recall, we celebrated the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the gospel from that day, we heard this verse. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. He saw the heavens torn apart. And this week, just a few verses later in the same gospel, Mark's gospel, in the same chapter of Mark's gospel, we heard these words just now as Nancy read them. As Jesus went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brothers John, who were in their boat mending the nets, mending the nets. I've been struck in recent days of these a juxtaposition of these, these two images, the heavens being torn apart and nets being mended. Of course, there's much else that we've all seen in the course of these past weeks. We are, we are citizens of the world, after all, and there are world and national events that have caught our attention so much of late. We've seen a lot of tearing, haven't we? of society being threatened to be just torn apart, rent in division and disharmony. The Sunday of the baptism of Jesus two weeks ago was read on the Sunday immediately after the attempted coup and the insurrection under the dome, under that round embracing dome of the US Capitol building on January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany. For many of us, myself included, I think, I felt as though the nation was well on the way of, to being torn apart. It's interesting, the word in the Greek, the original Greek in, March, in, in Mark's gospel is schismenos, from which we get the English word schism, which means, of course, a rending asunder, a cleaving, a tearing. When Jesus' baptism takes place, there's a, there's a crack, there's a fracture in the universe. The whole order of reality seems to be ripped apart. And it's from that ripping, that tearing, that the Holy Spirit comes from that, from that splitting. As though a dove, that spirit comes and, and actually doesn't just land on Jesus, but it fills Jesus. That light fills Jesus. Of course, I can't help but think of that that verse that has been often quoted um, from the Canadian singer, poet, Leonard Cohen. Uh, there's a crack, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in, through these fractures. I suspect those who are able to see it, and there's some 
difference in how the Gospels describe the scene of the baptism of Jesus, whether it was just Jesus who saw that tearing of the heavens and the Holy Spirit descending, or the crowds that were there assembled. But whoever saw it, if it was just Jesus or all of all those who had assembled on the banks of the, the River Jordan, the scene must have been at first very troubling and disruptive, perhaps even troubling to Jesus, immersed as he was in the troubled waters of the Jordan. But something infuses Jesus at that moment, a word of grace, as the voice from heaven proclaims, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You are my, my beloved, in whom my soul delights. Scripture tells us in Mark's gospel that immediately, with a real sense of urgency, Jesus is driven by that same spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And we'll hear that part of the scriptures in a few weeks as we enter the season of Lent. But again, note those words, torn apart, driven, hurled into the wilderness. The scene is not a gentle, tranquil, comforting scene, really. It's not these words of being driven or torn apart are not, not words that you necessarily see in Hallmark cards. It's not a Hallmark card vocabulary. So this morning, soon after that scene, is the scene of Jesus walking along the coast of the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. And he sees there first Andrew and Peter, who are brothers, and then two other brothers, James and John, along with their father, Zebedee, and some hired hands who were doing hard labor, hard work. Um, they're heaving wet rope, maybe hemp, ropes and uh, rope nets into the water and hauling them in. Then later, James and John, with equally hard hand blistering work, James and John are mending nets that we assume had been, again, torn apart, ripped by the labor and wear and tear of trawling and dragging. Mending nets throwing them back in, hauling them in. Jesus doesn't say that he's going to rescue these disciples from, from these hard tasks, but only their new calling will require efforts with a different goal in mind, to fish for people, to draw them in, to repair what has been rent and split asunder. I'm thinking about vocation these days, and, and maybe in the hour that we have of, of uh, adult education, we could talk and reflect about where does God lead us into God's holy work, even in the work that we do day to day or in the occupations that we are involved in day to day? How are you being called? How are we as a church being called to enter into those, those rendings, those those uh, schisms even, and also to mend, to mend, to repair, to put in place those things that make community, that draw us together in, in the very present loving God. I thought I'd tell a story of something that happened to me um, just last spring. Um, as winter was ending and we had already been uh, been in seclusion um, as COVID has the this phenomenon of our of our shutdown and uh, seclusion has been been building. And I had a day off from my work as a bishop, and I decided I would go into the backwoods of our small property and and build a bridge on some part of the land in the woods that was that was really yucky and mucky and wet. So that I could uh, haul some, some old um, uh, firewood that had been fallen. There are a number of dead trees, sadly, on our, on our property that have been killed by the, that emerald ash borer beetle that has been 
just decimating the ash tree population. A lot of trees needed to be felled. Um, they need to be cut and split and hauled back to the house to keep us warm this winter. And uh, it was, I think it was May or early end of April and the bugs had just started to come out. It was gritty work and the chainsawing and the hewing trees so that I could make a more solid passage through the, through the wet areas so I could pull with a cart the logs that I had made. There were black flies beginning to emerge and gnats and it was sweaty and it was drizzly. And yet I was satisfied because, you know, my work and what I do during the week, there's often not a sense of a beginning, a middle and an end. It just seems kind of like you just keep trying. But this work did have a beginning, although I haven't quite seen the end of it yet. Now through the gaps in the trees in those woods, I could see my neighbor's house. My neighbor who I'd met before, but you know, the political season was getting hotter and more intense. My neighbor had signs during that last season that made it clear that, that he and I were probably not gonna vote for the same candidates. Every day I drove by his house and the signs got bigger. The sounds got, they got more intense. They got more numerous. They even got more angry. It was becoming clear that he probably did, really didn't wanna to talk to anyone who had a differing view than he did. Just I got that sense from the, from the signs and especially um, because there was one new sign that uh, I saw emerge out of the, the collection of signs that he didn't have from the last election. And that sign said this, no trespassing. So to borrow words from Star Wars, I think it's Star Wars, I really felt that there was suddenly a disturbance in the force. That if I could see our life and our relationships and society as a net, as a web of, of relationships, there was a tearing and it was becoming more, more obvious and more disturbing. Um, in my biblical way of seeing things, I could say that the heavens, reality itself, was being torn apart. And I wasn't sure I could see the light, the dove of the Holy Spirit coming in that, that fracture, that crack. And is, is, this the, is this the end time or is this the beginning? A call to mend and repair. And as I was chainsawing and sharpening with my file, the teeth of my chain and saw and wiping the sweat from under my helmet, I kept thinking of my neighbor and I was feeling in myself disturbed and kind of breaking, my heart breaking, that I didn't really know my neighbor. I had made an effort some years before to, to meet him and we did, we had a wonderful conversation, but this was, this was getting scary. And it occurred to me as I was in the noise of that, I call it St. John's Red, my chainsaw. <laughs> in the noise of that whir and that buzzsaw, I had this feeling, this, this voice tell me, what if, what if that no trespassing sign and the other almost obscene signs that kept saying, get out, go away. And you know what, you, you, where you could go if you don't agree with me. What if those signs were really saying to me, not to everybody, but to me, I wanna talk, I need somebody to talk to. What if, it, what if my work out in the woods with the crowbars and the chainsaws and the axes and the mauls was really not work at all, but work avoidance. Maybe I was avoiding the work that I was really being called to do. It was as though God was calling me at that moment, put down your, da your darn saw and go pay that man a visit. So with 
trepidation and anxiety, I, I decided I was gonna do that. And I put the saw down and I walked, I walked over there. And as luck would have it or fortune or grace, he happened to be outside working on a door. And I called out, hey, Pat, remember me? And he said, oh yeah, you're that Episcopal minister or something. How have you been? And then I realized that the boundary, that border all of all those signs began just to crack a little bit. And then we just started chatting. And it was full small talk about the weather, about the season. But let me say this about small talk. It's important. It's important because it's the kind of the lubrication of the beginning of relationships. It's how we begin to form and to see, and we begin to see our humanity one-on-one. -on -one. It's been noted and studied among sociologists and historians that during the rise of totalitarian regimes in other countries, wherever they emerge, it's noted that people start, they begin, when they begin not to look at each other, when they stop showing interest in their neighbor or even exchanging greetings, that that fuels fear, suspicion, and animosity among us. Things start to fall apart even worse. When people go to the other side of the street, when they see somebody that they disagree with politically, and they avert their gaze and not look at people eye to eye, begin to accelerate the falling apart and the tearing. It was harder for me to put down my, my hot chainsaw as it was spewing the bar oil all over the place. It was harder for me to put that down than to walk over the stone wall and to meet my friend, well, he wasn't really my friend. He was an opponent in some level, but he was a brother in Christ. We had we kept our social distance as we talked in his driveway. But then he invited me into his garage, which was the walls of the garage, the inside of the garage was, was plastered with some of the most scary, I have to say vulgar, aggressive language for people on the other side of his political persuasion. And he looked at all those, he saw me looking at them and he said to me, yeah, yeah, I'm, I know, I'm, I'm kind of a fanatic. But at that moment, it was not for me to say anything. I was a guest in his garage and this was not a place necessarily for political argument. This was a place to begin mending a torn net somehow. And I didn't know how to do it except just to be there. And I thought of myself if, in hindsight that there, we were both in a net. We were both in God's net of respect and dignity and love. And maybe somehow there could be some mending of that tear in the force of the heavens itself. Now, what I'm gonna tell you now is almost unbelievable and you're gonna think I made this up, but I didn't. Everything I've said so far is absolutely true. I wouldn't lie to you, I don't think. It happened. As I've said before, if we show up, God surprises, God surprises. And that's what happened, I believe. Among all the flags and the posters and the banners and the signs and some of the most bizarre images I saw covering the walls inside of this small garage, there was hanging a poster framed in a worn out wooden frame painted with faded gold and black paint. And there was this old yellowing image like a lithograph and the image was of Jesus bearded in the old way that we've seen images of Jesus in a white robe, but his hand was directed towards his chest and there was a split, a rip in the robe, an opening. And within that open tear, 
where Jesus' heart would be was indeed a heart. And it was circled with a wreath of thorns and there were images of blood drops. It was Gothic lettering around it and it said, Vene à l'église sacré coeur which means <clears throat> come to the church of the sacred heart. My neighbor saw me looking at it and he, he asked me, do you know what that is? I found it at the dump and I just picked it up. It, I was just captivated by that image. Now I'm a Catholic, I know it's Jesus and I, I think it has something to do with the sacred heart, but I don't know what those other words say. I knew enough French from my high school and college days and it said on top, come to the church of the sacred heart. It was an opening of a new church in Sacred Heart Church. And it dated from the 1930s. That church has now been made into a group of condominiums, I believe. And it was, but back then, this is a poster about its, its announcement that it was about to open. <clears throat> Surrounding the image of Jesus and his sacred heart, which is rather grisly, were other words. And I could see them through the, the grime and the dust. It said this, now I'm gonna say this, pardon my French. Notre Père qui est au ciel, que ton nom soit sanctifié, sanctifié, que ton règne vienne, que ta volonté soit faite sur la terre comme au ciel. And then I started to translate. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then I heard next to me, my neighbor joined me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God was catching us both in a net that was just beginning stitch by stitch, prayer petition by prayer petition to be mended. It was, a, it was suddenly the no trespassing sign uh, almost like disappeared. And we were both then in that garage caught in a kingdom moment. It became in the midst of everything else, a kind of church. I wonder what work we do now, what work that we do that is seems so important that keeps us from doing those kinds of things from maybe walking over those stone walls. Who in might be putting up a no trespassing sign, but who actually might be saying, let's talk. My neighbor and I clearly voted for different candidates, but his signs are down now. Although now he has a US flag that's hung and it's upside down in some way that hurts even more than all the other signs but he's a child of God and he recognized me as a child of God. And we've both had enough of the rending and I hope you have too. So let us mend our nets as best we can, even if it's just by the stitch of small talk and may God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It is indeed at hand. Amen. Oh,